you are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Kenyon SRAM. Stage 19. Today we are in Toledo. Two days later, I walked into Toledo. Here we go. I'd find a brilliant white thin just inside the city gate, so dazzling it seemed to be carved from salt, but the bruising impact it made on the eyes soon warned me that something was wrong. I remember climbing into the town, hugging the narrow shadows and accompanied by rainbow hallucinations, then staggering into a wine shop for a glass of water and dropping unconscious on the floor. Hello, Daniel. Again, Richard Moore again. <laughs> no, 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 that is Laurie Lee. As I walked out, one midsummer morning, his memoir of traveling around Spain, and he actually fell ill until he done that. That's sort of appropriate because I've fallen ill. I am ill. I've got a horrible cough and stuff. Lionel's ill. That's why he's not here. He's been vomiting. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Always fine. I'm bulletproof. <laughs> well, I am. Where was that? Rodez. We remember Rodez. What's when was that? What happened? A couple of years ago? Yeah, I was here, but I still kept working. <laughs> Absolutely. Titan- and I'm, what, what am I titanium. doing here? Titanium. I'm working wow. hard here. So Toledo, yeah. Well, here we are in the home of Federico Bahamontes, who home was on the podium, 91 home, years old. Home of El Greco. The El Greco, yeah. Well, old Laurie Lee went to see El Greco when Painter, he was here. sculpture. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful city. You've been here before? No. What do you think? Um, it is very beautiful. I look forward to having a good look um, tomorrow in the morning because it's a relatively late start, although we're quite a long way from the start. But I don't know about you, Rich, but we were very late getting to the finish today. There was terrible traffic around Madrid, so we only made it to the finish about 15 minutes before the race actually came into Toledo. Yeah, it was horrendous. The, the Madrid ring road, wasn't it? crossing the Sierra was not just a stage on my journey, Daniel, in spite of the physical barrier. It was also one of those sudden jerky advances in life, which once made closes the past forever. It was a frontier for me in more ways than one and not not till I'd passed it that I really feel involved in Spain. Um, Talking of frontiers, I had another unconfirmed report of another unconfirmed uh, foray into Portugal for the Vuelta a España today. Teo Gegenhart. Teo Gegenhart was convinced convinced. that that the Vuelta went into Portugal last year, but again, I've looked at the maps and this is a fairly dubious report. Well, it was a it was a good stage today, wasn't it? I mean, there was a lot went on, a bit of beef as well at the end. A lot of a beef. lot of beef, a lot of beef, um, and a bit of Argentinian steak on display at the finish as well. Poor Max Ricchesi, his uh, didn't have much clothing left, and his well, his bottom, frankly, looked in a pretty bad state. So, um, yeah, it didn't didn't look good. But it was a nasty crash. There's been some more footage of the crash that that took out Tony Martin from the race and brought down. Pimas Roglic and, and cause some drama. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in this episode, I'm, I want to bring your attention to uh, an interview we got later on with Willie Smith, the South African on Katusha Alperson. It's quite a quite amazing interview. He's quite had quite an incredible life, and uh, we'll hear from him in some length a bit later on. But here we are, stage 19 to Toledo, last host of stage finish here in 2010 when Philip Gilbert won, and he was one of the favourites once again today. Uh, a break went pretty early on. Um, Sylvain Dillier was there. Remy Cavagna was there. Lawson Craddock was there for EF Education First. Scabu Gourmet from Mitchison Scott. He's been on the attack a lot. He was there. Ben O'Connor, um, he's been up the road a lot as well. Uh, Nickius Arndt, former stage winner, of course. Uh, Shane Archbold was there as well. And then he dropped back for some reason. And we wondered whether that was tactical because he's an important teammate for Sam Bennett at Bora Hansgrohe. I spoke to Shane Archbold at the finish. Well, not here at the interview because he wasn't that happy but he just he just wasn't going well enough to be in the break and he kind of got there by accident so he dropped back the break got a, a good lead and you know it looked like they might they might fight it out um until there was this crash really and uh, that was about 65 kilometers to go correct it happened actually right at the front of the bunch a rider slipped on the wet roads going down a descent and tony martin sort of somersaulted over him he was the worst hurt, along with Max Ricchesi, but a lot of the Jumbo Visma riders were caught out. And in the, the kind of confusion after that, the race entered a, a sort of plateau with, with a bit of wind, not as much wind as the other day, but a bit of wind, and Movistar went to the front and really drilled it for about 15 kilometers. A group of about 30 or 40 um, 
But, you know, it was a, well, it was a very controversial move that got people talking, criticizing them later on. After about 15 kilometers, Alejandro Valverde ordered them to stop uh, driving it. And the, 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 that group kind of, well, the, the Roglic chasing group came back and, and everybody um, was back together. Miguel Angel Lopez was one of the other ones who, who was caught behind Superman. And in the end, Remy Cavagna, the young Frenchman on De Kuhn and Quickstep, who attacks a lot, he had a go with about 25 kilometers left from that, that break of uh, 14 or so riders. A long way to go on your own, especially in these kind of windy conditions and with the climb up to the finish. But actually, it was a, a pretty good move given the riders they had behind De Kuhn and Quickstep. So he held off the chases. Craddock was one of the guys who tried to get up, up to him. Uh, so was Nikias Arndt. Who's that? Daniel, you seen someone that you know? It's Rob from EH, EF Education. Oh, so it is. What's he doing here? Um, friend of the podcast. Um, who else was up in that move with uh, Lawson Craddock and Nikias Arndt? Oh, it was Bruno Armirai. Correct. Uh, from Group Am FDJ. Not seen a lot of them this well, have we? Very inexperienced team, but uh, Armirai's actually ridden quite a good race. Um, he's been quite prominent. Promising rider. Mm. So was uh, Cavagna, and he held off the flying bunch, really, to win. Head of Sam Bennett, who rode extremely well and powerfully up that, that climb, which is quite a hard finish, uh, with Philip Gilbert third and um, Zdenek Stebar fourth. So three De Kooning quick Quickstep riders in the top four, and no real changes to any of the jerseys. The fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with cat. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Kenyan SRAM. Thank you to Rafa, our title sponsor. And uh, Rafa have quite a lot of things on during the World Championship week in Yorkshire around Harrogate. Have a look at rafa.cc for all the for the menu of things that are on during that week up in Yorkshire, which is approaching fast. Um, Daniel, the beef. Yes. We should get straight to the beef because that was the main talking point at the end of the day. Let's not particularly tippy tap around. No, with no, any partic- tapas. Let's get straight particularly, to the Particularly strong words from Superman. Yeah, Superman really let rip. Um, you get you have these moments in press conferences and and uh, mix zones when a rider will do that, and everyone is sort of starts salivating because um, you you immediately know that you've got good quotes, a good story, and that was the case with Superman. He, he um, what tends to happen in the mix zone is that um, there'll be, you know, they'll do one set of interviews and they'll move along the line to, you know, to the next seat and Superman just kept reloading um, and saying exactly the same thing, basically that, that well, the actions of Valverde were unbecoming of a world champion. Shall, uh, shall I read the, the go quote for that it, I've got go here? For it. I think it was very bad of them, movie star, a complete lack of respect with the red jersey and the rest of us. Around 20 riders or more were on the ground and they always take advantage of this kind of moment. This isn't the first time we've already seen in other moments and in other races that they always behave like idiots. It is always the same people that do this kind of thing. That is their way of being and we all know that they are like this. I want to see a day... Movistar win a race with their heads held high. Wow. wow. Boom. Um, were you aware of this beef between Astana? Is it, I, I, I kind of feel that I should be aware of it or more aware of it, and I, and I wasn't until today. Long-standing beef, you mean? Well, it's th- those comments suggest that, or those comments suggest that this is something that's often thrown at Movistar, which, frankly, I've not really noticed. But then um, I, I have seen... People's reaction, and you know, on social media, and a lot of people are sort of bringing up previous incidents. And but there have also been times when Movistar have been on the wrong end of this kind of thing. Um, I spoke to their direct sportive Jose Luis Arrieta afterwards, and he made that point that today there was there was no barrage as well, which meant that Primoz Roglic could kind of get in yeah, in the slipstream of the of the cars, and so could Superman, and and consequently limit their losses. But Arrieta was making the point that in the past, um, Movistar have been, have been, as I say, um, the victim of this kind of thing, and, and there has been a barrage, and they've not been able to get back up to the peloton. So, um, I don't know, Rich. Um, part of me thinks that this was all to do with placement and it's it's a skill to be in the right place it's it's strategy as well to be in the right place at a point of the race when everyone knew or, or the team seemed to know we perhaps weren't weren't aware of exactly where the crucial point was but they seemed to all think that this was a crucial point and 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 that's probably why the crash happened because it was a big fight for positions you know were the movistar riders better prepared in a better position than Superman and Roglic and should they therefore be rewarded for that I mean just watching some I don't know if you've seen this footage Daniel but this is some footage I've just seen of 
the crash. You see, it's the second rider in the bunch. I can't see who it is who hits the deck first. So the positioning argument is a bit, it's not really, it it's wasn't a bit really. It's isn't it? Yeah. And, and I, I do also think that attacking the leader, the guy in the leader's jersey, um, after he's been involved in a crash, that's almost the last sort of sacred cow of the unwritten code of honour in professional cycling. Um, you know, a lot of things um, have fallen by the wayside over the years. And, and you know, sometimes in, in the past, we've felt the etiquette and the calls for, for riders to, to sort of respect and adhere to this etiquette have been a little bit pedantic and a little bit over the top. But I do feel that that is the one sort of last bastion of you know, this kind of chivalry that, that has existed. There's no doubt it has existed in professional cycling. One thing that really did strike me was um, that there was no sort of senior figure. Where was Fa Fabian Cancellara, you know, riding up? He's to retired. The, well, riding up to the... I thought he would appear. I thought he'd come, <laughs> out of his, come out of retirement, pop out of the commissaire's car at that point, ride up to the front of the bunch and start ticking off and waving his finger at Valverde. Um, but that was, wasn't the case. There's some suggestion that Gilbert... Well, I, I spoke to him at the finish and yeah. he, he said that wasn't the case. Mm. Um, it's one of those things where you could almost see the riders behind Movistar, you know, maybe shaking shaking their heads in a in a virtue signalling sort of way, while also thinking this is pretty good, you know, this kind of works for for me. And I, I you know, that's maybe unfair, but um, I don't know. It's but also also I think it's the point that Lionel also um, often makes that if you think about it, forget the morals and forget the ethics <coughs> of it. And, and the honour code, if you think about it purely from a strategic point of view, is it a, a bridge worth burning for the sake of, you know, what Movistar were going to get out of it? Um, is it is the juice worth the, the squeeze? You know, is it going to come back to haunt them in this race or in future races? And I just, I just think that it was a battle probably not worth fighting. 60 kilometres from the end of a stage like that. And I think that had they gained time, had they gained a minute or two minutes and put Val Valverde back in a position to win the race, I think it would have been devalued without a doubt. And, and I, I just don't think it was worth it. There's quite a lot to unpick there. I mean, Arietta, when he said that, there, when he not noted that there wasn't a barrage, so there were, the team cars were still behind the group, uh, offering some help to riders coming back up. Was he, did he think there should have been a barrage at that point? Well, the, the whole issue of when there isn't and isn't a barrage is a pretty contentious one, isn't it, Rich? And it's one that's not necessarily fully understood, certainly not by us, and it's, I don't think it's always understood by the DSs and the, and the riders in what circumstances one is applied or not. And it yeah. often has to do with safety, isn't it? Yeah, Arietta told television during the stage that because there was no barrage and the, 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 the cars were still behind the group, that they didn't feel like they should slow down because there was a chance, a good chance here for the riders coming back coming back to get back on and he also said that the team are prepared to attack in the crossroads before the stage now you know if they, if they did feel they should slow down they did well they didn't that's, that's why they slowed down eventually, eventually. because they, they knew there was no barrage right yeah so there was no point in, in pressing on with the cars behind the group and the riders able to get back that way and um, that, that makes sense but had they just started riding on the front and then the crash had happened then they would have been perfectly entitled to carry on. I think so. You know, this issue of was the race on or not, you know, we've seen circumstances in the past when there's been a, a concerted move by a team which has almost provoked the, you know, provoked a crash or provoked an incident or um, it's certainly been been obvious that um, a team has attacked or accelerated and, and then subsequent to that, things have happened behind and and in that instance i think it's more ambiguous it's more difficult and i have more sympathy with the team that then that then continues its its effort and um, in this case for all that the the riders and direct sportives were talking about the tension coming into that point of the race it wasn't obvious that that movistar had launched some kind of offensive i think they were they were positioning themselves for what they thought was going to be a key point in a few kilometers time but so were jumbo visma and so were mm. Astana. I think Movistar, they would have known, they did know that Roglic had come down or, or been held up by the crash because, you know, the, the roads were open after that point, after that descent with the, with the corner. The roads were pretty open. They could look around and see the group was 30 or so and that Roglic wasn't there and there had just been a big crash. So I don't buy the argument that they, they didn't know that Roglic had been caught the up awesome in the crash. Banger argument. Argument. Well, listen, Daniel, at the finish, I spoke to Tim DeClerc of De Quick Step, um, always such an important writer for them, of course. 
about the another win for the team, you know, what their plan had been and the Movistar tactics. Another great day for the team though. Yes, first the plan was to ride for Phil and Stevie. In the end, uh, Remy went into the break. It was a little bit difficult uh, for our tactic, what we had to do then, because he was strong, but there were also some uh, other strong guys. But then uh, we said to him uh, that it was better not to pull all day. In the end, he is very strong, and if he didn't pull, he, he got uh, he got the resources uh, in him to win, so it was, uh, it was perfect. And also behind, uh, we had still uh, Stibi and Phil, so it was, uh, was perfect. He's uh, obviously a strong rider. We've seen him on the attack a lot in this Vuelta. He seems to be riding very well. I think he's one of, our, of the strongest guys on, uh, for sure on the flat. He's, uh, he's incredible. He has so much uh, leg speed. So, yeah, it was just waiting uh, uh, in the beginning of his career. Maybe he was not uh, the smartest rider, but now in the team, they... Uh, yeah, they, they have a really good way of, of handling him and now you see the, the results are coming and uh, it won't be his last victory like this, I think. We saw you in the front group after the, the crash which involved Roglic. What did you think when Movistar began driving? If they were already riding before, I would understand, but really riding, if, if the leaders on the ground, on a moment there was no racing before, for me personally, it's it's uh, something I would not uh, rather not do, but yeah. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast team car, the back of the pack, please. Thanks to Seb PK, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, interrupting our Vuelta coverage to remind us to tell you that this episode is sponsored by LACA, bicycle insurance powered by the community. Let's hear from Jens, one of the three co-founders of LACA, about their model of insurance. From the outset, we wanted to create a better way for cyclists to insure their bikes and gear. When we looked at traditional insurance, it got clear that insurance is a fantastic business model for the shareholder, but not the customer. With LACA, we created a simple community-based model for bicycle insurance. We help our members when their bike is damaged or stolen and share the cost at the end of the month with the community. For every claim, we charge a small fee to the community. This way, the community is directly rewarded for taking care, and we only make money when we are really needed. It helps us to really focus on you as a cyclist and when you need our help the most. If you want to check out LACA and perhaps sign up to cover your bikes and equipment, go to laca.co.uk. That's LACA spelled L A K A. LACA covers your bikes and equipment for theft and damage at home and abroad and even covers you for sportives and races, as long as you're not a professional rider. LACA says that to cover around £2,000 worth of gear, it should cost about £8 per month with fees capped so that you should never pay more than £17 a month for that level of cover. So if that sounds like the sort of insurance you'd like, check out LACA at LACA.co.uk. Well, Daniel, this morning I went and spoke to a guy who I've been wanting to speak to properly the whole Vuelta, and I was going to see him on the second rest day, but their hotel was changed on the, at the last minute, the day before they were due to, to stay in their hotel. It was changed 50 kilometers away from Burgos, so they were moved at the last minute. Katusha Alperson, that is. The rider is Willie Smith, South African rider. Um, it's his second year with Katusha Alperson, second year in the World Tour. Yeah, Willie Smith was involved in that big crash into Oviedo and really suffered a terrible injury to his knee, a very deep gash. So we heard from him in an earlier podcast, and it wasn't clear at all then that he would be able to finish the race. Uh, but here he is, still still in it, and uh, he's got a, an interesting backstory. I, I was alerted to this by a very good piece in Pro Cycling Magazine last year by Sophie Herkham. Um, it was really well beautifully written piece actually about his life and um, growing up in South Africa and how he managed to get himself into the world tour so I've been keen to speak to him but you told me something tonight Daniel that I didn't know well he's a, a two handicapper at golf supposedly you, really yes extraordinary um, and I think he, he he had designs on a career in golf up until about his 16th birthday much much like myself rich <laughs> well you didn't uh, did you make it up to 16 uh, uh, you not packed it in by no, then i kind of packed it in when i was about 13 14 packed it in i mean i you know i kept my hand in <laughs> you can still swing a club can't you anyway um so i spoke to willie smith this morning and well here's here's some of his life story i mean i've been interested to speak to you since i read a fantastic piece in pro cycling magazine last year i think it was um about your life and and the journey that you have been on to get to this this level it's quite a story i mean growing up in south africa you didn't have the easiest of childhoods did you yet you were brought up by your grandparents 
yeah, so, so basically I was living with my mom. She was an alcoholic at the, at the time. And then child custody took me away from her, put me into the care of my grandparents. Um, and then, yeah, it was big court cases. And then she said, no, she's fixed her life. So I went back there while my father was working in Afghanistan lifting landmines. They were never married as well, so it made it more complicated. Eventually I went back to my mother, but... Yeah, I wasn't attending school as much and the community I was in, I was obviously involved as, with bad friends. Uh, but I don't I don't want to see it that way. I just see it as uneducated friends and then you kind of follow each other. You know, it's like chicken, the chicken follows the other chicken. Again, child custody took me away and from, uh, yeah, from there on I started living with my grandparents. I actually got to see my father, met him, and then shortly after he was back to Afghanistan where he passed away, which was actually very sad for my grandparents because uh, it was their only son out of five children. They got really depressed, and my grandmother actually had no illnesses, and she picked up Parkinson's from, from, from there on, which was sad for her in a way, and it's not nice to see them that way as well. And then in, at the same time, my mom's... You know, she's been alcoholic for 30 years, so she's not changing her ways, and there's not much she can do for. And then it's been tough because she stopped speaking to me as well in, in, in that period after a while, because you, you grow apart as well, and yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's just life. And we, we lived on the farm, so my grandparents will never replace my real parents. You don't have that connection with your grandparents as a normal, they were very strict, but very good for me and supported literally everything, especially cycling, because it was expensive, you know, I mean, buy a frame, always a new group set, and as a junior, you also crash a lot and break a lot of stuff. And then they said, well, you need to have good marks to go to university. Um, so it was a lot of pressure in between that and getting good enough marks to study uh, a law degree, which I then pursued and tried. Um, oh, I do live in the hostel, which made it also much more complicated because you have to follow their rules and, you know, you've got this whole, uh, what, what do they call it, PT? Or, or, well, I, I don't know what it is where you have to go with the groups and they kick your door open at four in the morning and it's part of being in a hostel. Um, to work through that, you know, studying enough and then trying to cycle, which completely didn't work. And then after yeah, about three years of studying, got through the three years, and then I got a contract in Nippo, Vini Fantini, which randomly just happened on Facebook when one of the agents contacted me. Went really well, and then I picked up from as a fagitis, which kind of fucked up my three, four years of my career. And then, um, yeah, I just ran through the South Africa. That's also a long story on its own, but uh, it was basically because of too much antibiotics. Um, and seeing the wrong doctors every time you get a... You know, in university, you pick up a lot of diseases and stuff like that. It's part of being a student. And then too much antibiotics cause the fungoesophagitis, which is like a fungi that grows in, the, in, in your lungs here. Um, uh, oh. I mean, yeah, you're, the, you're cramming a lot in there. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get... Yeah, yeah to just give, give a timeline. So then basically... The, it, the, it started well very average as a we had really good program in Nipo Vini Fontini as a continental team back then the year before they went pro continental but then that kind of ended my career for, for a bit then I ran through the South African teams for about two years um, before going to a really small French team and then in 2017, I said, this is my last chance of becoming a professional where I really changed a lot of things in my life, stayed really focused, and doors just opened from there as I went to through a Spanish team. I lived with a Spanish family in uh, the in Vigo, Galicia area, and luckily that manager knew the manager in Team Katusha, and my results were good enough, and they took me, so that's all the... And we remember you from Bergen as well, the World Championships. Yeah. You put a very strong ride in there. The, the thing that changed now is everyone is strong. Everyone can put in a strong ride. It's mostly about which teams you are in. Because remember, there's a hierarchy and the bunch as well. I think you've, you probably noticed it on the crosswind stage in stage 14. You get Jumbo Visma, Movistar that crosses the road. And the rest of us are on the back sitting in the wind. And it puts just like a ticking time bomb where you get dropped. You can't go squeeze into the line of Movistar to get protected from the wind because you've got the hierarchy and the GC. So, and it's a lot of the time like that in bunch. That's why you never, you rarely see those guys crash, and everyone in the back crash. But the level is so high this year. 
um, everyone is strong and everyone's doing motor, uh, tra- altitude training camps everyone's super skinny um, oh. it's a tough sport I mean it's... but I mean it sounds trite but what what has cycling do- done for you after the you know the circumstances that you grew up in yeah. what's it done for you uh, it yeah I just w- when I lived on the farm there wa- farm there wasn't much else to do except ride my bike which allowed me to go to different towns see a lot of places and meet a lot of new friends and that's actually why I started and yeah it, most of all yeah it made me oh, much more disciplined um, gave me a purpose in life um, because I'm sure if, if you have no purpose in life especially um, <laughs> us as men our, our head, we, we, we won't be satisfied just sitting at home and you, um, you make these videos as well and I gather you edit them yourself um, the thing that makes them stand out they're very upbeat um, and, and very sort of positive is that, is that, your, is that your mindset now? I'm normally extremely positive. The the bad thing with with I would say Western guys like me is that we really get um, our mood is determined by the people around us. So if I'm not in a happy environment, it immediately affects my mood. I like to be at a table where people speak. Maybe it's an Australian American type of thing, and that's a bad thing as well because yeah, you get affected by the people around you and so if, if I'm in a good mood with good people, good staff like we have in the team, it's it's super nice And this is your first Grand Tour and I know when you had this, this crash and this injury, you really feared that you wouldn't get through the next day, yeah. you did get through the next day and now we're just a couple of days from Madrid how difficult have the last few days been? No, the, 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 the pain is I can handle now the first two days was terrible but the biggest problem is I'm forced to take antibiotics to prevent the uh, infection and that's killing me. I'm completely empty from that. Um, we knew that was going to happen but it's two days to go um, and I still need to take it until Madrid. Otherwise the team won't let me continue. Uh, what, what would it mean to you though to get to Madrid? I'm not exactly sure about the facts but I think I'm one of two South Africans to have ever made it onto a Walter team not through a South African team or through South African support which is for me an achievement in its own and I've made it I really had to fight for position on the squad it wasn't planned two months before Um, it was basically just based purely on form if you've got good enough condition to go so that's another reason I I didn't want to disappoint the guys but also they're not forcing me to continue Um, yeah and then like many people say if it you know, if it was a third Grand Tour, they probably would have abandoned. But it's my first one, so I think to finish it, yeah, it's, it's a lot of a, a lot of things. That, uh, yeah. There's uncertainty around the team. What what are your plans for next year? Do you know what you'll be doing next year? Um, yeah, we actually saw a tweet um, from some journalist on Twitter that said we're having a merger, and we've been informed yesterday. To be honest, no one has any clue what's going on. So uh, I think that's complete bullshit. <laughs> I've got a pro continental offer with a guarantee in a Volta Espana start, which is nice. But obviously, if I'm able to stay um, um, in the World Tour, that would be great. And I'm really hoping to join Team Dimension Data or NTT for next year. At the moment, it's yeah, it's in the air. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, it's home team. Well, but also, I don't know what happens here. So. <laughs> A lot of, and there's a lot of good, good, good riders without contracts. So anything can happen. We we saw it with Aqua Blue when a lot of their riders were only signed in what November, December. So a lot can happen. But it is stressful and not nice for anyone involved, the staff especially. Yeah. Well, that was Willie Smith, and what what a story and uh, what what a guy. And I recommend watching some of his videos on his YouTube channel if you get a chance. They're really he edits them himself, as you mentioned there. Um, and he's been doing them for quite a while, so there's quite a back catalogue to get through. They're very sweet, some of them. Daniel, he mentioned at the end there about the situation with Katusha Alperson, you know, lots of rumours about uh, mergers more than new sponsors. I, w- I was speaking to one of their members of staff earlier in the race who said that you know, they understood there were discussions going on with potential sponsors, but nothing concrete. There was a, a story that Willie Smith mentioned there that in the press this morning, or, or a journalist, I don't know who actually tweeted about um, a merger having been agreed and the writers being told that's not that's not the case apparently it doesn't look good for Katusha Alperson and they haven't done a lot of this Vuelta to sort of further their case for a new a new sponsor have they 
No, they haven't, but um, I spoke to another rider this morning, Steph Crass, and he talked to me about the toll. It's um, all the uncertainty has taken on the well, the mood in the camp, particularly. He said it's not been a good atmosphere. He made no <coughs> bones about that whatsoever. <coughs> you know, they've come here with a bit of a, I wouldn't say ragtag team, but, uh, you know, certainly a, a team with very sort of mixed abilities or mixed sort of characteristics and, yeah, hoping to be opportunistic, but it hasn't quite worked for them yet, has it? You, got, you see guys like... Um, Batalin, who should have been, well, today's today's stage finish was absolutely perfect for him, and he hasn't really been a factor in the race. He's another of the walking wounded, though, isn't he? He's 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 got a lot of uh, strapping on, and he seems to be in in quite bad shape. Um, so yeah, it's not not been great for them, and th they've become a sort of a strange sort of identityless team in a way, haven't they? Having started off as the Russian Cycling Project, they've they've sort of lost that identity. If, if that was, an, um, you know, important to them in the first place. Yeah, I think they have. And um, they sort of were decapitated in a way by uh, Marcel Kittel's issues. Kittel's involvement or Kittel's signing for the team was very much connected to the to Alperson's involvement with the team. And I think, you know, had Kittel been a roaring success there, then we, we might now be sort of contemplating a different future for the team. Um, Alperson, as we know, are pulling out. I think they were probably they were probably open to the idea of a fairly long-term commitment to cycling had, had they had someone like Kittel as their standard bearer. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. You can get 25% off all your Science in Sport products at scienceinsport.com. Just at the checkout, use the code SISCP25. Before we go and refuel, Daniel... Well, well, I was about to say, should we mention our meal last night? Oh, yeah, we should. It was... Um it was probably the best meal of the world yeah. so far. Um, yeah, without question. Well, I'll mention the wine. We had a lovely Albarino uh, from Riash Basha region, which is right in the northwest corner of well, Galicia. It was delicious. Delicious white wine. I had scallops. Well, I had a sardine ceviche to start with, served on... Served on big slices of lime with like a ceviche um, foam on top of... Foam, yeah. Yeah, it was it was delicious and we had to eat these in a one -er. and then I had the the scallops with a kind of uh, on a sort of with noodles and what was the other there was another fish in there mussels actually mixed in with the noodles which was oh, it was, it was and absolutely as you said, splendid Rich, it, was, it was nice wasn't it, it was it? very it was nice, nice as you said at the time famously. I start, started the day with a relaxing massage today I treated myself to massage because I, the, all the driving has played havoc with my back and I've been having a few back pains so that was that was nice and relaxed. I think you were a little bit jealous of that, weren't you, Daniel? Moving on. Anyway, let's hear from our audio diarist. Well, I'm hoping we'll hear from both of them. As I speak, we haven't actually got uh, James Knox's um, audio diary. I gather he was caught up in the crash today. But we do have birthday boy Nick Schultz. So what you might what you hear now might be just Nick, or it might be Nick and James. Uh, I'm at the mercy of, of James Knox here. It was here. also Sepp Kuss's birthday today. And I think... Um, Raphael Micahs yesterday. Oh, well, I think Nick Schultz and, um, I might be wrong, Nick Schultz and Sepkus might be the exact same age, which means they were born on the same day. What a coincidence. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, that would that would make sense. Uh, so, yeah, let's hear the writer diaries now. Stage 19, done and dusted. One day closer to the end of this race. Never a dull moment. More wind today, more stress. Yeah, break went pretty quick, but it sort of took a little while to be consolidated, and uh, it was actually looking like it would it would just uh, end up being a relaxed day, and and the ten guys that went away would go to the line. But a uh, few teams came together and rode to control it. But there was just uh, a lot of stress uh, in the peloton today, a lot of nerves created by the the strong winds that were blowing, and uh, also the the average weather that was that we were coming into in certain parts of the, the stage with rain and slippery roads and yeah eventually there was a, a real a massive pile up a lot of guys came down uh, poor old Noxie came down uh, Rodgelick came down a lot of yeah massive crash right at the front of the, the group um, and then things really just uh, split to bits I'm not really sure what happened after that the, the, the 
pace was was lifted a lot in the at the front of the race, which which was a little bit bizarre. But I guess it was it was at a point of the race where where things could have gone down and it just made for carnage for the rest of the day. I personally was was feeling pretty bad today uh, after a big day yesterday and a pretty poor night's sleep last night. Sometimes after really hard days when you're really fatigued, it's it's hard to sleep well. Um, and I suffered a bit through the night last night, uh, struggling to get some some hours in. But uh, that's that's part of Grand Tour racing, and it is what it is. Uh, it's just another one in the pocket today, and uh, yeah, one really big day tomorrow um, before we get to promenade into into Madrid. A lot of rain on the forecast tomorrow, uh, so it will be a very interesting day, and I think it's it's all up to play for. Not much else to report on, really. Um, it was my birthday today. I could think of a thousand other things that were better to do than be uh, stressed on a bike in rain and wind. Yeah, it makes it all the sweeter when it's when it's over. One person asked on Twitter if there'd be any cake or what cake there was. Uh, well, we haven't uh, haven't quite got to dinner yet, so we'll see if uh, the chef's prepared anything. But I'm not really expecting anything, and if there is a cake. Uh, I'm sure none of us will be eating too much of it with uh, what's in store tomorrow. But yeah, thanks for listening. Keep it quick tonight. Stage 19. Yeah, not really what I was hoping for. A lot of stress. Some wet Spanish roads and lost my front wheel on a fast corner. Big crash and obviously everyone saw what happened afterwards. Pretty disappointed. A bit embarrassed. Very, very sore, but managed to finish the stage. Spent the evening in hospital and then came back to celebrate with some champagne, which was, you know, a strange one. Trying to be happy, but struggling. Um, still an amazing team performance. I'm sure I could have saved a lot more in different circumstances, but yeah. Hope everyone is okay in the crash. It was pretty nasty. And then, yeah, it was a mess afterwards. I'm not sure if I'll be able to finish tomorrow. We'll see. Now our writer diaries or diary. Both of those, both those writers, um, James and, and Nick, are are shortlisted for Peddler to Charm. Uh, they received a lot of nominations, so their diaries have obviously gone down well with you, the listeners. That's great. James is actually leading Peddler to Charm at the moment, so he may well be going home with a a Peddler to Charm T-shirt as well. Any other business from today, Daniel? Mm, not really. No. Um, hang on a second. Hang on a second. We're yeah. doing an odd thing now, aren't we? We're basically we, we came here today from. Avia, and we're basically heading back there oh, tomorrow. I've got some other business. Um, I looked um, high and low in vain this morning for Carlos Sastre because I knew he would be there um, because he's from Avila. Um, and then I saw him at the last minute just as the race was about to go. I was busy. I was off to do something else. So I couldn't speak to him, which was a bit of a shame. We did see Federico Bahamontes, though, on oh, the he podium. He was there, was he? He was, he was on the podium okay. with Roglic. Um, I wondered if Roglic knew, you know, Rog doesn't doesn't He's strike a me as a, of no, as a great student of the sport. Uh, <laughs> but um, they had a long chat on the podium. I mean, I think um, Bahamontes is is quite a quite a character, isn't he? Yeah. Quite a larger than life oh, sort absolutely. of character. Absolutely, he 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 can talk. And at ninety one, I think he would have been jealous of your mass <laughs> massage this morning. Really? Why? <laughs> See, Apparently quite a ladies' man. Oh, really? <laughs> well, anyway. Um, <laughs> He uh, he was uh, he he doesn't look his age. He looks he looks very sprightly for ninety one. Um, and there's a statue of him that we passed on our way up to the the press room today, which I took some photos of. This will be lost on you, Rich. But he reminds me he's the, he's the kind of Gary Player of. Do you know, have you ever no, heard of Gary a, Player? He's a golfer. Gary, a South African golfer. He's a golfer. He's very much on message. Um, Gary Player, you know, I think he does a thousand sit ups a day. He's about seventy eight. He, he looks about. Uh, 55 and um, Bahamontes is kind of in that vein mm, mm. Um, right well let's go and find something to eat shall we in this beautiful town I haven't, I haven't really done my homework on specialities in Toledo no um, well let's let's do that now thanks very much Daniel thank you Richard que nos vamos de...